At the onset, one must notice that this Catholic apostasy, which eventually became the cruel persecutor of the Jews and the true witnesses of Jesus, originated with Jews and Christians in the land of Israel. The first symptoms of disease that began to appear in the body of the early Hebrew Christians derived from brethren who believed that circumcision and the keeping of the law of Moses were essential for salvation. The 15th chapter of Acts records the opposition of the apostles to this movement. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, saying, it is needful to circumcise them and to charge them to keep the law of Moses. After much debating, the dispute was resolved with the condemnation of this teaching and letters were sent out from Jerusalem to all the Christian ecclesias, beginning with the words, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. But the appeal of the new doctrine was too great for the declaration of the apostles to eradicate it. The law, or as it was known by the Hebrews, the Torah, had been given to Israel after the exodus from Egypt, not as the means of salvation, but as a disciplinary and organizational constitution for national existence that would direct them to salvation by faith. As Paul put it to the Galatians, wherefore the law hath been out tutor to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. From the Babylonian captivity onwards, however, Israel turned to the law more and more as a means of commending oneself to God through the externals of worship and of preserving national identity by that means. The Pharisaic traditions expanded far beyond God's commandments into an elaborate and burdensome ritual that oppressed the common Jew and exalted the rabbis. Jewish holy men went about in distinctive clerical robes with phylacteries, pouches containing copies of the Torah, ostentatiously bound to their foreheads and arms to proclaim their sanctity. As Jesus stated in Matthew 23. But all their works they do. For to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. The Sadducaic class, meanwhile, transmuted the beautiful worship enjoined upon Israel into a national commercial enterprise that paid enormous dividends in wealth and power. Under the persecutions of both Greek and Romans these religious institutions, although they were affected to a considerable extent by pagan notions of immortal souls and demons, and in spite of their association with much evident hypocrisy and corruption, became the bulwark of Israel's existence. In these circumstances as we have already seen, the acceptance of a crucified messiah, who, in the manner of his death, was subjected to the curse of the law, became an enormous hurdle for them to surmount. In these circumstances also, acceptance that the law had been superseded and that men and women of any race could be partakers in the Abrahamic and Davidic promises by faith and baptism into Jesus Christ was a further giant step. But besides the appeals of tradition, there was another factor too that predisposed Christians to the new doctrine that taught the law was still essential, the threat of persecution at the hands of Jews. The threat was real enough, as Paul experienced in many sufferings during his journeys. When writing to the believers in Galatia, he found it necessary to refer to some who had compromised the truth on this account. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. It is instructive to note that the whole of this letter to the Galatians was devoted to attacking this new doctrine, which, superficially examined, might seem to be a harmless addition to the gospel. In vigorous and blunt language, Paul called it a perversion of the gospel of Christ and invoked God's curse on any who preached it. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. This underlines yet again the deadly effects produced by the twisting of God's words after the style of the serpent's suggestion in Eden. Here then were the basic ingredients of the apostasy that would eventually triumph in Rome.
self-esteem, through meritorious acts and ritual. Compromise. To neutralize hostility. Commercialization of religion. In a search for wealth and power. And these but symptoms of lust of the eyes, and the vain glory of life. As stated in 1 John. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. The early Christian ecclesias, in the image of the unspoiled and pure Eve, were to be corrupted by these things, as Paul warned. For I espoused you to one husband, that I might present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled even his craftiness, your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity and the purity, that is toward Christ. The corruption would not arise from atheism or outright paganism. Paul went on to define the teachings as another Jesus, a different spirit, and a different gospel. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And the agents who would peddle them, as men posing as apostles of Christ, Hebrews, Israelites and the seed of Abraham. In due course the pure ecclesial virgin, finding the new ideas pleasant to her tastes, prostituted herself with the world. While the ecclesia developed into the church, only a small remnant of the seed of the woman remained true. Maintaining the purity of the word in faith, and practice amid a growing darkness. It is helpful to review some of the avenues through which the mystery of lawlessness, symbolized by the woman in the ephah, was developed. The doctrine of the natural immortality of man, or the immortality of the soul, is among the first of these. As we have already noticed in earlier videos, this concept is entirely foreign to the Bible, and owes its development to pagan sources. Being established in early Babylonian mysticism. And further developed in the Egyptian religion. Emphasis was given to it by Greek philosophers, especially Plato, around the 4th century BC, who speculated on an incorporeal, invisible, indissoluble something, akin to the gods, that was supposedly the real person, and which was released from the body at death. The historian Gibbon asserts that the Pharisees adopted this tenet from the philosophers and that, as the Pharisees had drawn into their party the body of the Jewish people, the immortality of the soul became the prevailing sentiment of the synagogue. The early Christians, on the other hand, looked for salvation in their bodily resurrection to life at the coming of Christ, when they would share in the establishment of the kingdom of God. But when men supplanted the physical resurrection of the body with a disembodied existence in ethereal realms, there was no longer a need to look to a reorganized earth as the inheritance of the meek. As Jesus clearly stated, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Some form of abstract spiritual regime was deemed more consistent with this view than was a physical earthly kingdom ruled over by a physically present messiah. Gibbon describes the change that occurred as time went on. The ancient and popular doctrine of the millennium was intimately connected with the second coming of Christ. Though it might not be universally received, it appears to have been the reigning sentiment of the orthodox believers. But when the edifice of the church was almost completed, the temporary support was laid aside. The doctrine of Christ's reign upon the earth was at first treated as a profound allegory, was considered by degrees as a doubtful and useless opinion, and was at length rejected as the absurd invention of heresy and fanaticism. Hence the doctrines of the resurrection and the kingdom of God on earth became adulterated as the church toyed with and then embraced the theory of the pagan philosophers that had already made inroads into pharisaic thinking. Indeed the true doctrine of the resurrection was already being questioned in the days of the apostles to the destruction of the faith of some as recorded by Paul to Timothy in his second letter, who concerning the truth have it, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. In the second century, according to Moshim, this philosophy was adopted by such of the learned at Alexandria as wished to be accounted Christians, and yet to retain the name, the garb, and the rank of philosophers. He goes on to add in a footnote, this cultivation of philosophy by Christian teachers 
greatly displease those who are attached to the ancient simple faith, as taught by Christ and his apostles, for they feared what afterwards actually happened, that the purity and excellence of divine truth would suffer by it. Hence the Christians were divided into two parties, the friends of philosophy and human learning, and the opposers of them. The issue of the long contest between them was that the advocates of philosophy prevailed. A large number of widely ramified sects attempting to rationalize Christianity with pagan philosophy and comprehended today, under the general title of Gnostics, began to flourish in the second century. Men calling themselves Christians indulged in the popular occupation of speculative philosophy on a range of subjects, including creation, the origin of evil, and the nature of Christ, thereby attaining the dual objectives of notoriety and of a Christianity more palatable to the masses of the empire. The simple truth that Jesus had come in the flesh as stated in 1 John. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. The being in the flesh, which was common to all men, was confounded in a welter of mysticism that had its origin in the notion of the separation of the deity from matter, which was supposed to be intrinsically evil. The virgin birth was rejected by some, with the real Jesus being defined as a part of God, that began to inhabit his body from his baptism, and which departed again before his sufferings. By degrees, Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah of Israel and Savior of the world, became more and more removed from kinship with the people he came to save, and was transmuted into a companion of the pantheon of pagan deities. In the words of Milman, Directly it got beyond the borders of Palestine, and the name of Christ had acquired sanctity and veneration in the eastern cities. He became a kind of metaphysical impersonation while the religion lost its purely moral case, and assumed the character of a speculative theogony. Meaning, to do with the origin of gods as described by myths. The degeneration of the doctrine was paralleled by the degeneration of the organization. In the early days the apostles declined the office of legislator, the word of God and the gifts of the spirit, diffused throughout the ecclesias being the sole authority in faith and conduct. Ecclesias were independent, being united only by the ties of faith and love, and mutual responsibility for each other's spiritual well-being. It is true that the apostles and their companions appointed overseers for the general welfare, but these appointments, which conferred responsibility and not authority, were soon subject to abuse. In many ecclesias at the end of the first century, one of several elders assumed the title of bishop in the governing role, and towards the end of the second, these bishops were meeting regularly together in provincial synods, to decide matters of doctrine and discipline. Of this period Gibbon writes. The institution of synods was so well suited to private ambition, and to public interest, that in the space of a few years, it was received throughout the whole empire. A regular correspondence was established between the provincial councils, which mutually communicated and approved their respective proceeding, and the Catholic Church soon assumed the form and acquired the strength of a great federative republic. Kellogg comments on the expanding hierarchical structure as follows. Multiplication of offices was clearly necessary as congregations grew, but it is plain also that it tended to exalt the chief men and to diminish that equality, which had once been so happy a feature in the communities. By the 3rd century, the mystery of lawlessness that had been working in Paul's lifetime had expanded enormously in numerical strength and organization. Taking its initial impetus from the momentum of the early ecclesias and borrowing heavily from the policies and traditions of the Pharisees and Sadducees, its cancerous growth had spread throughout the empire. Although separated from the Jewish diaspora which, since the wars with Rome, viewed the church with the contempt accorded a traitor, the emerging Catholic woman had received a substantial legacy from her exiled sisters, Jerusalem and Samaria. The precedents established by the Jewish clergy for philosophical speculation, accommodation with the world, empty ritual, religious commerce and priestly power, were brought to bear on Christianity by Judaizing brethren who sought to adapt the organization to ensure its longevity on natural, rather than divine, principles. But Catholic Christianity with the assistance of indiscriminate Greco-Roman paganism was destined, in due course, 
tip affect these diabolical corruptions far beyond the extent to which they had been taken by Jewish clericalism. Thank you for watching. Subscribe to get notifications of new videos. Like, share and comment below.